Now, it turns out that um, uh, I was following the trial of Anders Breivik. You guys remember he's the Norwegian who killed 77 young people. I was watching his trial last month in Norway, and, um, and here's what he said that I thought was interesting. He said, one might say that I was quite normal in 2006. I have my doubts about this. But anyway, he said, when I started training, when I commenced de-emotionalizing, and many people will describe me as a nice person or a caring, sympathetic person to friends and anyone, which I also doubt. But, but the point that I thought was interesting is that he nailed it. He, he knew that his own training regime was about de-emotionalizing. And he said, I've had a dehumanization strategy towards those I considered valid targets so I could come to the point of killing them. I mean, he phrased exactly what I've been telling you so far. He knew what he was doing. Now, his particular strategy for dehumanization was to play hours and hours of violent video games and to do meditation, to really concentrate on meditating to hammer down any emotional response he had to the idea of killing someone. That's the way that he trained. But, but the point is that what he was doing was shutting off the medial prefrontal cortex and other areas involved in emotion. That's what he was doing when he talks about de-emotionalizing. He actually got it exactly right. Now, if you don't have a training regime and you're not that good at turning off your own medial prefrontal cortex, <laughs> Governments love to do this for you, and that's the art and science of propaganda. So um, here's a poster from World War I. This is an American poster. Here's an American poster from World War II. And what you always do in propaganda posters is you make your enemy less than human. You always make them like an animal. So in this case, the Germans were portrayed as an ape, and he's coming onto America's shores with a big club. The fact that he's got a half-naked, voluptuous woman that he's taking away makes it even matter about the whole thing. But it turns out that you know, this is really typical of propaganda posters. You always give the enemies fangs and stuff like that. And, and the idea is you want to shut this off. You want to make the population feel like, OK, look, we can do this. We can go to war with these guys, because they're not quite like us. They're more like animals. And in fact, when Darwinian thinking got introduced in the 1800s, lots of people took the opportunity to put out pseudoscience suggesting that whoever their enemy was, they're not actually human, but they're less than human. And they used, um, they used uh, you know, false Darwinian arguments about it. And so this is a very typical sort of strategy to use. Um, and in fact, I don't know how many of you know this, but when George W. Bush was running for president against Al Gore, he did the same thing. So, so his commercial ran and said the Gore prescription plan. And then you see this big word, rats, on the thing. And then after about half a second, you see that the word is zooming in. And the word actually says bureaucrats. And it says bureaucrats decide. But what it starts with is this giant thing that says rats, which was something that the Nazis did when they were making films about the Jews. They put this footage. I mean, it's crazy that, and anyway, as soon as this got uh, a lot of attention, the commercial immediately got pulled. But, but the point is that the strategy of dehumanization is, is one that uh, people try to use a lot to make you feel like you don't, um, you don't, you don't have to think about the other person as a human. Now, how do you study this in the laboratory? Well, in 72, um, a researcher named Albert Bandura did a very simple study. So he had college students uh, come in to do an experiment from different colleges around. So three of you come in at the same time, and you're told that in the other room are three other college students. And they're trying to learn uh, some associations with words, and you guys are there to, to help teach them. And so the idea is that whenever they get a wrong answer, you send an electrical shock over to them in the other room, um, but you get to choose how high the level of that shock is from 1 to 10. You get to choose each time. OK, so that's the experiment. And what happens is just before it starts, the, the experimenter running it accidentally leaves the intercom on. And you overhear him say, these guys, meaning the, the students that you don't see, those guys are a bunch of animals. Or in a different condition, he says, oh, these guys are really nice. Or in a third condition, he doesn't say anything at all. Okay, That's it. The only experimental variable is that you happen to overhear him say something, either calling them animals or not. And so then, as the experiment goes on, every time they get a wrong answer, you get to decide between 1 and 10, the level of electrical shock that you're going to send. And what happened is, very clear results, in the dehumanized condition, people sent stronger and stronger shocks. Only difference being that they heard them described as animals at the beginning. 
Here's the neutral condition. That's sort of the average shock level that they sent. And in the humanized condition, they sent less. And I actually think this is of equal philosophical and scientific importance that they sent smaller shock when you said even a very simple thing that humanized them. And I'm going to come back to that issue. But for now, I want to concentrate on the dehumanization part. OK. So what I've told you so far is sort of the simplest picture that we can make about it. And, and I've told you about how dehumanization works, where it can sort of be turned on and off by, by simple statements and analogies and so on. But now I want to drill down a little bit deeper and show things that are even more subtle, not just on or off, not just human or not, but, but things that can be modulated very subtly. And this is one of the things we're studying in my laboratory. So, so let's start off talking about pain for just a second. So it turns out, let's say you put your hand on the table and I stab your hand with a syringe needle. Um, that activates very particular parts of your brain. These, this is what's known as the pain matrix. Don't worry about any of the details of it. But a certain network in your brain lights up. And that says, ouch, I'm in pain. I'm feeling pain. Now. What is empathy? What if you watch somebody else's hand get stabbed? It's not your hand now. Now you're watching someone else's hand. It turns out it's the same area. The same areas become active when you're watching somebody else in pain as when you're in pain. So in other words, it's the same thing. Watching somebody else in pain and empathizing with them is literally feeling their pain. You are running a simulation of what it's like as if that were your hand. That's what empathy is. You're literally simulating what it's like to be the other person. Now, the surprise is, even though this is a very low-level neural response, it can be modulated by what you think about the other person. So there was an experiment done by Tanya Singer where she had people play a little, um, a little game with other people where they're doing a little exchange of money. And the other person, it turns out, can kind of play unfairly or fairly. So you're either playing against Someone who you feel like, oh, yeah, that person did just the right thing, or, oh, that person's a little bit of a cheat. And then you see the person get an electrical shock, and the question is, how much does your brain care? And the answer is, here's a measure of the empathic neural activity. It turns out that just based on their behavior, you stop caring about them. Now, there's a lot of individual difference here. And on average, men show this effect more than women. Um, but what you can see is that it this very basic neural response about seeing someone else in pain gets modulated. Now, this is based on their behavior. And one of the things that I started wondering about my work was, could this be based on something that's not even behavior? You haven't even met the person. You've never seen the person. But it's just based on the in-group or out-group that they're in. Could that actually modulate empathy? So here's what I did. Here's how, here's how this works in neuroimaging. So you're in the scanner. We show you six hands on the screen. Then the computer goes doo -doo 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 -doo, and randomly picks one of them. And that one expands uh, to the middle of the screen and becomes a video. And either you see that hand get touched with a Q-tip or it gets stabbed with a syringe needle. And so what we do is we contrast those two conditions and we find out the areas of the brain that are involved. Again, don't worry about any of these details. I just want to indicate that there's this network of empathic areas. It's the same network that I showed you just a minute ago. OK, once we've established this baseline condition, we just make a very simple change, which is now we have the same six hands on the screen appear, but now they all have a one-word label. Christian, Jewish, atheist, Muslim, Hindu, Scientologist. A hand gets selected, comes to the middle of the screen, and then you either see it get touched with a Q-tip or stabbed. And the question is, what's your in-group, and how does your brain respond to seeing somebody else get hurt? So I'll just give you an example of how this goes. So on this axis is time. Here's where the selection takes place. Here's where the touch happens, either the, the stab or the Q-tip. And here's the signal that we're measuring from the brain. So in the baseline case here, when you get stabbed, boom, your brain shows a lot of activity in this, in this particular area. It shows an empathic response. When you're touched with the Q-tip, there's sort of nothing going on here. OK. When you watch the out group get stabbed or touched with the Q-tip, what happens is your brain doesn't really show much of a response in either condition. Sorry, this is out group pain or no pain. OK, but what happens when you watch your in-group is this. So what happens is when you watch your in-group in pain, you have this huge neural response. And when they get touched with the Q-tip, you don't really have anything. So what happens is you've got this in-group empathic response and your brain just doesn't care when you see an out group member get stabbed. Now, again, there's a lot of individual variability. And one thing we're doing right now 
is studying what things those correlate with. So, so we measure lots of other features about people. We have them fill out empathy questionnaires, questionnaires about their religious certainty, about their right-wing authoritarianism, all kinds of other features, and we're, we're, we're studying that data right now. But what's clear is that for some people more than others, it's absolutely modulated by who's in their in-group and out-group. And what I thought was really funny and interesting is that we even see this for atheists. Atheists care when they see an atheist hand get stabbed, and they don't care when they see someone else's hand get stabbed. So what it means is it's not, uh, it's not some deep indictment about religion. Instead, it's a very simple thing about labels. It's about whose team you're on. And, and I should mention that this applies for every group that we've mentioned equally. Okay. Um, now, something that got me interested is that as we were rolling on these experiments was how flexible these sorts of designations are. So if you look, for example, during World War II, um, when the, you know, the Americans and the Soviets hated each other, and then in World War II, they were both aligned against the Axis powers. So now they were buddies. They were clapping each other on the back, sharing cigarettes and so on. As soon as World War II ended, they were back to hating each other. And I thought it's interesting how flexible these things are. So here's what we did to, to try to get at this issue. Um, now we do the same experiment. We put you in the scanner, and it says the year is 2013, and the, we pick three random religions, have teamed up against the other three randomly selected religions. Okay, so now you're in the scanner, and you see the six hands on the screen, but now you've sort of got teammates. These other religions that you didn't care about a minute ago, and now they're on your team. And the question is, what happens when you see someone else's hand get stabbed, and they might happen to be on your team? And, and the answer is we find regions in the brain that are what we call uh, coalition sensitive or alliance sensitive, which is to say, which is to say now, you know, five minutes ago they, they didn't give any care about the outgroup, and now just because we've told you in a single sentence narrative that this outgroup is on your team, now you kind of care when you see them get stabbed. It's fascinating how flexible this is. Not all areas of the brain change are single, but, but several of them do. And so what this means is even though these labels Something like a religious label runs so deep, right? And yet it's so flexible. And what got me interested in doing is trying a third phase of the experiment, which is to, to really understand about the arbitrariness of these labels. Um, and so what we do is you come into the lab, and uh, I hand you a coin, and I say, you're going to toss this coin. If it's heads, you're an Augustinian. If it's tails, you're a Justinian. That's all I tell you. I don't tell you anything else. So you toss the coin. Let's say you're a Justinian. Um, I now hand you a bracelet. I hand you a bracelet according to which team you're on. You put it on. It's a nice little thing. Um, okay, so now you go in the scanner, and I give you a one-sentence narrative. The Justinians and the Augustinians are two warring tribes. And then I remind you, remember, you're a Justinian. And then we put you in the scanner, and it's the same thing. We choose hand, we stab Justinian or Augustinian hands, and the question is, does your brain care more about a team that you were arbitrarily assigned to? And you know it was arbitrary because you're the one who flipped the coin. And the answer is yes. We've, we're just analyzing this data right now, but that's what happens. It's a smaller effect, but a totally arbitrary team label is sufficient to make you care more at a very low level. This is a very basic neural response. So this is the kind of thing we're studying right now, and the reason it's important is because what it gives us is a diagnostic tool for measuring the degree of in-group, out-group. In other words, how much do you care about your in-group, and how much do you not care about your out-group? And that tells us the difference there. We can quantify that. And this gives us a tool into the future to understand the effect of rehumanizing narratives. What are the different interventional strategies that we can use to actually make these come closer together? So I'll come back to that.